Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on the Great Controversy. That's a major, major part of Seventh-day Adventist beliefs. And this is lesson number six for May 11 of 2024, entitled The Two Witnesses. Hmm. Well, let's see what we can find out about the two witnesses. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of studying in more depth these very important portions of Scripture. Guide us in our understanding and our presentation that others may understand as well as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In this lesson, we will be focusing on the two witnesses and what they accomplished down through the 1260-year period prophesied in Daniel 7. I mean, I'm sorry, it is Daniel 7, but Daniel in Revelation. Jim? The Bible Study Guide. This study centers on the foundational role, authority, and power of the Word of God in the Great Controversies. Specifically, we will focus our attention on the Word of God as re represented by the two witnesses who preached in sackcloth for the prophetic period of 1260 years. After Jesus ascended to heaven, the devil directed his efforts and energy against God's Word, the Scripture, and against God's people. The mission of the church was to testify of Jesus Christ and His Word, which is the revelation of God's character and His will. Let me interrupt for just a second. <clears throat> I wish I had this quote from somebody. I don't know where they got it, but someone claimed that from all of recorded history, there have only been 11 years when there wasn't war going on somewhere. And three and a half of those years were when Jesus was here. I wonder why there weren't wars in other places. Mm. Satan had his tension focused right on Jesus Christ, I'm sure. I'm sorry, Jim, go ahead. Uh, in Revelation 11, the Word of God is represented by the Old Testament expression, uh, expression the two witnesses, Zechariah 4:14. What did the two witnesses mean to Zechariah? The metaphor speaks to the fact that the Word of God has a perpetual presence and power, being of divine origin, having been transmitted through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The parallel between Jesus and the Word is obvious. In the same way that Jesus had ministered three and a half years under the presence and persecution of his own people who were supposed to receive him. Scripture ministered to the word for th world for three years and a half prophetic. Three and a half prophetic, prophetic years. For prof prophetic years or 1260 years under the pressure of the very people that claim to be guardians of the word of God. Just as Jesus, the word of God, died with and was resurrected. Scripture, the word of the word of God, and uh, quote quoted uh, the quoted died and was resurrected. Jesus was triumphant, so his word will be triumphant, and his people will be triumphant in him and in his word. From the Bible Study Guide. Okay. So the question is asked there: What did the two witnesses mean in Zechariah four? What did Zechariah? when there wasn't the Old Testament and the New Testament? That's the question. Well, that's, what's the answer? Well, he, it, it talks about the two different sources, the two olive trees, which pour oil into the things and so forth. So, but, so what are the, the, two, the two witnesses were these olive trees. <coughs> which were what? I don't know. The reason I put the question here, I wanted people to think about it. This lesson discusses two major themes. One, Charles. The two witnesses of Revelation chapter 11 symbolizes the Holy Scriptures. The two witnesses ministered in a time of persecution during the prophetic period of 1,260 years between 538 and 1798. Let me interrupt for just a second. It's possible that in Zechariah's day, he thought the two witnesses were the Torah, that what we would call uh, the writings of Moses and the prophets. You know, was in, later they, they had the, the writings of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms or the hagiographer. 
so forth. Um, I suppose that possibly. Go ahead. At the end of the prophetic period, the two witnesses died and were resurrected, just as Jesus died and was resurrected, pointing to the fact that God will have, through Jesus and his Holy Spirit, the final victory in the great controversy. Okay. So what peaches identify these two witnesses? Now we're going to challenge you, listeners out there, to follow very closely here because we're going to do something which is probably valid, but is not like concrete. And that is we're saying, okay, here's two things that look the same, they sound the same and so forth. There's no direct linkage, but does that mean they're talking about the same thing? So let's see, let's, let's follow that and see where we go. From the Bible study guide. Through the centuries, God's word has been dissected, doubted, and discarded. It has been chained in monasteries, where Luther found it, by the way, mm -hmm. burned in public squares, and torn to shreds. Its believers have been ridiculed, mocked, imprisoned, and even martyred. Through it all, God's word has prevailed. The medieval church persecuted faithful Bible-believing Christians, yet God's word illuminated the darkness. Oppression and persecution did not stop the proclamation of the Word of God. As English Bible translator William Tyndall was tried for his faith, he was asked who aided him most in spreading God's Word. He pondered the question, then answered, the Bishop of Durham. <laughs> the magistrates were shocked, and, and that's because the Bishop of Durham was his adversary. Yeah, exactly. Tyndall explained that on one occasion, the, bis the bishop purchased a supply of his <clears throat> English Bible translation and publicly burned them. He was trying to eliminate them. Yes. What the bishop did not know at the time was that he was greatly aiding the cause of truth. He had purchased the Bibles at a much higher price than usual. With such a large purchase, Tyndall was able to print many more Bibles <laughs> than were burned. The truth crushed in the dust has risen again and again to shine in all its brilliance. Great story. <laughs> yeah. hmm. Yes. In this lesson, we will explore one of the most vicious attacks on the scripture and the Christian faith. During the French Revolution, blood flowed in the streets of France. The guillotine was set up in Paris's public square and thousands were slaughtered. Atheism became the state religion. Nevertheless, the witness of God's word could not be silenced. That's from the Bible study guide for Sabbath afternoon. Okay, Myra. Revelation 11, three to six. I will send my two witnesses dressed in sackcloth and they will proclaim God's message during these 1,260 days. And the two witnesses were the two olive trees and the two lamps that stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes out of their mouths and destroys their enemies. And in this way, whoever tries to harm them will be killed. They have authority to shut up the sky so that there will be no rain during the time they proclaim God's message. They have the authority, have authority also over the springs of water and turn them into blood. They have the authority to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they wish. Okay, so now the question we're gonna ask you people listening in, who had the ability to do all those things in the Old Testament? So let's move on and see what we can decide. What are the marks of these two witnesses? Well, if you look carefully through that, um, what forces in biblical history fit the description in Revelation 11? There are two olive trees. There are two lamps. They have fire from, the, from their mouths. We'll learn more about that later. The ability to stop the rain. Elijah did that. Who did that? The ability to cause water to change to blood. And the ability to cause every kind of plague. Who did that? Moses. Zechariah 4 in the Old Testament refers to the same images and we find in Revelation 11. Olive trees feed oil to lampstand so that it continues to give light. Psalm 119 makes it very clear that God's word gives light. We would agree with that. 
oil represents the Holy Spirit, Zechariah 4, 2, and 6. John picked up these same images in Revelation 11. So, did God just guide him, say, pick up these things, or did these things come together in John's mind? Good question. I directed him, no doubt. Yeah, what power has demonstrated that it can stop the rain from falling and send ten plagues of all types on the earth? Only God's word. God's authority. During the Dark Ages, God's word uh, was represented by the Bible. It was not the power of Moses or the power of Elijah that caused those uh, similar things to happen in Old Testament times. Okay, now here's what some other Bible writers have said about these things. James 5, 17. Jim? <clears throat> Elijah was the same kind of person as we are. He prayed earnestly that there would be no rain, and no rain fell on the land for three and a half years. Good news translation. And I love Good that story. Life. I mean, imagine this bump, hum, we would call him a country bumpkin, comes marching into the king's palace and says, there's not going to be any rain for the next three and a half years. Nobody. Well, he just walked in front of the king, which... And then he just turned around and walked out, and before yeah. anybody could think what to do, this was he was Ahab. gone. This was Ahab, I think, right? Yeah, Ahab, yeah. <laughs> Very pagan king. Well, <clears throat> okay, so 1 Kings 17 and 18 tell the story of Elijah confronting the prophets of Baal. Remember, the end of that story, he says... Bring all your prophets up here at the top of Mount Carmel and let's, uh, let's have a showdown. Mm -hmm. And I'm, what, do you think, I, you, what do you think those prophets of Baal thought when they were called up there? I'm sure they figured out, oh, we'll, we'll figure out a way to sneak some wire and we'll fire into this stuff. Well, anyway, these were Elijah's words as all that was taking place. 1 Kings 18, 21, Elijah went up to the people and said, how much longer will it take for you to make up your minds? If Lord is God, worship him. But if Baal is God, worship him. Wow, how can you argue with an I mean, how could you argue with something like that? And then, of yes. course, we know what happened, don't we? Gordon? Oh, no. I, in Exodus 7, we are told the story about the plagues being sent to Egypt. It was certainly true that Pharaoh and all of his followers were opposed every, who opposed every decree that God made, suffered by losing their lives. And Jeremiah comments on that. Jeremiah 5, 13 and 14. They have said that the prophets have nothing but wind, are nothing but windbags, and that they have no message from the Lord. The Lord God Almighty said to me, Jeremiah, because these people have said such things, I will make my words like a fire in your mouth. The people will, will be like wood, and the fire will burn them up. Good okay. News Bible. Okay. The words in your mouth will be like fire. Well, that's one of the things we, we read about in Revelation 11, isn't it? It's important to notice that in John 5, 39 and Matthew 24, 14, the words of the Bible are referred to as witnesses, the, the Greek, exactly the same Greek word, using the same word in Greek as is used in Revelation 13, where it is translated witnesses. Sackcloth is worn in times of mourning. What does that imply? Myra? From the Bible study guide, who are these two witnesses? In view of these biblical points and the characteristics given in Revelation 11, we can conclude, not dogmatically, however, that the two witnesses are the scriptures of the Old and the New Testaments, communicating God's light and truth to the world. Okay, it seems pretty obvious to us that, that if there's two witnesses that are disseminating the light, in our day, it would be the Old and New Testaments. Of course, a lot of our Christian friends don't bother with the Old Testament. And our Jewish friends don't bother with the new. Yeah. yeah. Read Revelation 11. Is it clear to you that these events from the Old Testament parallel the words of Eli Revelation 11? So now we've seen all the passages from the Old Testament that seem to parallel Revelation 11. Does that mean that these things are linked or they just happen to be, they just happen to sound the same? 
Well, what is the significance of the 1260 days of prophecy? Well, let's look at that. The two witnesses, quote, will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth, Revelation 11.3. This is the same time period as the 42 months during which the Gentiles, those who oppose God's truth, will tread the holy city underfoot, Revelation 11.2. The enemies of God tread underfoot God's truth for 1,260 days, that is 42 times 30 equals 1,260, each day symbolizing a year in apocalyptic prophecy and God's two witnesses, the Old and New Testaments, prophesy against them during the same time. Now we're going to find out that in Daniel, even it uses a different term. As we already have seen, in Daniel 7.25 says the little horn power that would arise out of the breakup of the Roman Empire would persecute God's people for a time, times, literally two times, and half a time. So what's one plus two plus half? Three and a half, isn't it? <clears throat> time is one year in the, in the Jewish calendar, 360 days. So three and a half times equals 1260 days from our Bible study guide. So they've done the math for us. What does the Bible sometimes, why does the Bible sometimes say three and a half years, sometimes 1260 days, and sometimes 42 months? Were God and the prophets trying to hide something? Okay, come on, all you geniuses. Yes. Is this a way of God saying, okay, those who want to study God's world carefully and do their homework will understand, but the rest won't? Uh, cursory reading might, it might slip over the head. Yeah. But in-depth reading, hopefully we will pick this up. Okay, Jim, you want to pick up there the Bible study guide? When the authority of Scripture is rejected, other, that is, human authorities arise instead. This often leads to persecution of those who uphold the Word of God, which happened during the time of papal domination from, from A.D. 538 to A.D. 1798, when the medieval church descended into spiritual darkness the decrees of men substituted for the commandments of God. Human traditions overshadowed the simplicity of the gospel. The Roman church united with the secular power to extend its authority over all of Europe. And we could tell you lots of stories about that. I mean, just hair-raising stories about the domination of the Catholic church during those years. So during the 1260 years, the word, his two witnesses were clothed in sackcloth. Their truths were hidden under the still under the pile of tradition and ritual. These two witnesses still prophesied. The Bible still spoke. Even amid the spiritual darkness, God's word pres was preserved. There were those who cherished it and lived by its precepts. In comparison to the masses of Europe, they were few. The Waldenses, John Huss, Jer Jerome, Martin Luther, Ulrich Zwingli, John Calvin, and John and Charles Wesley, and a host of other reformers were faithful to God's word as they understood it. Yeah. Bible study guide. <laughs> Amazing stories. Notice just a few of the most important contradictions to scripture that were introduced at that time, well, by the Catholic Church. Sacred Sundayness, sun, I'm sorry, Sunday sacredness, the authority of the Pope, consciousness after death, and the role of priests in forgiving sins on this earth. Those are just some of the big ones. In Revelation 11, 7 to 9, we are told that a beast comes up out of the abyss. Let's read that really quickly. When the, they finish proclaiming their message, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will fight against them. He will defeat them and kill them, and their bodies will lie in the street of the great city where their Lord was crucified. The symbolic name of that great city is Sodom or Gomorrah. People from all nations, tribes, languages, and races will look at their bodies for three and a half days and will not allow them to be buried. Okay, that's the story in Revelation. And... We are told that a beast comes up out of the abyss, okay? All you abyss experts, who's the beast that comes up out of the abyss? 
Dragon. The dragon? You have another name for him? Satan. Okay, and the devil. he's called the beast. He's called the, the devil. Yeah, all those names. Okay, who's uh, Charles? Yeah, by AD 538, the pagan Roman Empire had collapsed. Justinian, the Roman Emperor, surrendered the civil, political, and religious authority to, to Pope Vigilis. The long period of medieval church dominion began. It continued until 1798. The French General Berthier, on orders from Napoleon, marched unopposed to Rome on French on February 10, 1978. No, 1798. Pope Pius VI was taken captive and brought back to France where he died. This date makes the prophetically predicted end of the Roman Church's secular authority 1,260 days or years as depicted in Daniel and Revelation. So that's an important point which is not emphasized very well here. The 1,260 days or years represent a time when the religious authorities exercise secular and even military might. Yes. Now, they lost some of the, well, basically at the end of that 1798, they, they, they didn't lose their, all of their spiritual, you know, authority. The political, they did. But, yeah, but, but they, lost, they lost the political and civil and military authority. But they regained it in 1929. Yeah, it was given back to them by, by Mussolini. And Mussolini. Right, right. So that's what the, the beast was wounded. Yeah. We did, mm -hmm. in, and the wound was healed. Wounded in 1798, and it was yes. healed in 1929. 1929. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. What a powerful manifestation of the truth of biblical prophecy. Daniel, writing more than 500 years before Christ, so accurately predicted the events more than 2,300 years later. We can indeed trust the prophecies given in the Bible. Meanwhile, okay. Just, I mean, think about that. I mean, we can't even predict what's going to happen in the stock market tomorrow. <laughs> You'd be sure what the weather's going to do tomorrow. We don't know what the weather's going to do tomorrow for sure. We, if, when the market is in progress, we can't predict what it's going to do in 15 minutes or an yeah, hour. Yeah, exactly. And yet God predicted something precisely 2,300 years in advance. Uh, unfortunately, more than some minutes. folk who have even gone through the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Theological Seminary Many. in Andrews University uh, misrepresent and misinterpret these prophecies that just joining the Protestant Church's blindness into this. Mm -hmm. That's called adulterating the message. It is sad. It is very sad. Yes. Go ahead. What a powerful manifestation of the true uh, biblical prophecy. Daniel, writing more than 500 before, before Christ, so accurately predicted events more than 2,300 years later, we can indeed trust the prophecies given in the Bible. Meanwhile, yeah. during all this, the truth of the gospel was kept alive by the witness of the word. But even greater challenges threaten Bible, tr biblical truth. The beast that ascended from the bottomless pit, Satan made war against the scriptures. He initiated new assaults on the Bible's authority through the French Revolution that began in 1789. In the French Revolution, the government officially established the cult of the reason as a state-sponsored atheistic religion, indeed to replace Christianity, a festival of reason was held nationwide on November 10, 1793. Churches across France were turned into temple of reason, mm. and a living woman was enthroned as the goddess of reason. Now, reason sounds wonderful, doesn't yeah. it? Mm -hmm. But, but. What that meant is human reason as yes. opposed to God's yeah. word. Yeah. So Bibles so were burned in the streets. God was declared non-existent, and death was pronounced to be an endless sleep. Satan worked through goddesses, godless men to kill God's two witnesses. Their dead bodies would lie in the streets, and the great city 
which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now, let's think about that for a minute. There's a very confusing words there. Sodom, Egypt, Egypt, the Lord was crucified. How could that apply to a relatively modern city? Well, let's look at some possibilities here. Gordon, you want to pick up, pick it up there? Egypt was a culture of many gods that denied the true God. See Exodus so, 5, 2. Okay, so there's one example. See, this is a godless symbol, okay? Sodom represents gross immorality. In the French Revolution, God's two witnesses, the Old and New Testaments, lay dead as a result of the atheism and immorality that ran rampant as normal restraints were loosed in revolution and bloodshed. Revelation 11.9 says that the bodies of God's two witnesses would, would lie unburied for, quote, three and a half days, end quote, from the New King James. That is, prophetic days representing three and a half literal years. Atheism was at its height in the French Revolution at least for about three and a half years. What a coincidence, huh? Mm. The period extending from November 26, 1793, when a decree issued in Paris abolished religion, to June 17, 1798, when the French government removed its restrictive religious laws. So uh, three and a half literal years, three and a half days in prophecy. Mm -hmm. so, then Revelation 11, 11, after three and a half days, a life-giving breath came from God and entered them, and they stood up, and all who saw them were terrified. Yep. So what happened to these two witnesses who appeared to be dead? Myra? Okay. Bible study guide says, at the end of the French Revolution, God's word would figuratively come to life again. There would be a mighty revival. Great fear would fall on those who saw God's word once more become the living power of God unto salvation. At the end of the 18th century, God raised up men and women who were committed to taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. People spread the message of the Bible rapidly. One such person was William Carey, who traveled to, to India and translated the Bible into dozens of local dialects. Propelled by the power of the Bible, missionaries were sent around the world. That's from the Bible Study Guide. For okay, us. and I would encourage all of you listening to pay attention to this next paragraph because the real challenge to the French Revolution and so forth wasn't just the fact that, uh, you know, the French suddenly said, well, okay, it's all right if you go back to your Catholic churches. This is what really made the difference. On March 7, 1804, the British Informed Bible Society was founded with the aim of supplying Bibles and New Testament scriptures. Without note or comment, they said, okay, we're not going to create any big arguments and warts and whatever. Just the scriptures, no notes, in the, no, notes no, no extra supplemental materials. Um, and a worldwide basis in a language people could understand at a price they could afford. This society, with its aim to make the Bible available as cheaply and widely as possible, made the decision to eliminate the portions of Scripture that were known as the Apocrypha and which were particularly emphasized by the Roman Catholic Church. The society sponsors such people as William Carey, who carried the truth to India. And there's a website you can look at if you want to follow that up. This was the beginning of the death knell for the cult of reason and its atheistic beliefs. Um, the infidel Voltaire once boastingly said... This is quoting from Ellen White. Yeah. I am weary of hearing people repeat that 12 men established the Christian religion. I will prove that one man can may suffice to overthrow it. Gener generations have passed since his death. Millions have joined in the war upon the Bible. But as it is so far from being destroyed that when there was a hundred in Voltaire's time, there are now 10,000. Yes, a hundred thousand copies. N now more than a billion, we've already been told, of the Book of God. In the words of an early reformer concerning the Christian church, quote, 
The Bible is an anvil that has worn out many hammers. Great Controversy 288. How does an anvil wear out a hammer? Because the hammer is used so many times. Yep, it does. Yeah. It does. Remember, and the other thing is, remember, you're, in general, you're pounding on really hot metal. So every time that happens, there's potential for, but it, it does. Anyone thinks he can destroy God's word and eliminate its influence is a fool. Those are my words. How does it make you feel when you read or hear stories about these reformers? Jim? Well, the Bible study guide. Revelation 11 begins with Satan's attempts through the French Revolution to destroy the Christian faith and eradicate belief in God. But the, but the chapter ends with the triumph of God's kingdom over the principalities and powers of evil. It provides encouragement to all who go through the fiery trials as for the cause of Christ and his truth from the Bible study guide. Okay, so what are we, what's being suggested there? There might be a time of a little bit of a trouble coming up in the future. <laughs> yeah. Revelation 11, 15 to 18, make it clear that these two witnesses once again arise and influence the entire world. God will triumph in the end. Charles? The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord. Christ is victorious. Evil is defeated. Jesus wins the Satan and Satan loses. Righteousness triumphs. Truth reigns. We would do well to heed the following instructions. Whatever is built upon the authority of man will be overthrown, but that which is founded upon the rock of God's Immutable word shall stand forever. Ellen White, Great Controversy, page 288. You wonder what the enemies of these reformers thought. I mean, did they think, these crazy people, what in the world is wrong with them? Why are they willing to die for this stuff that they read in this book? Well, we're seeing it, okay? Go ahead, go ahead. From, from the Bible study guide, within the ark or covenant box was the law of God. And this is part of what was seen there. Let me just read that. Revelation 19, 11. 11. God's, 19. Hmm? Did I say, I'm sorry, Revel 11. Revelation 11, 19. God's temple in heaven was opened and the covenant box was seen there. Then there were flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder and earthquake and heavy hail. Okay. Continuing in the Bible study guide, although we are saved by grace alone through faith, obedience to God's laws, to God's law reveals whether our faith is genuine. The law of God is the basis or the standard of judgment, James 2.12. This fact becomes especially important and relevant at the end of time. Bible study guide for Thursday. From the, from the great right. controversy in response to that. When the Bible is, was proscribed by religious and secular authorities, when its testimony was perverted and every effort made that man and demons could invent to turn the minds of people from it, when those who dared proclaim the sacred truths were hunted, betrayed, tortured, mm. and buried in dungeon cells, martyred for their faith, or compelled to flee to the mountains fast, fastnesses. Mm -hmm. Fastnesses. Yeah. It's a, Hiding well, places. Yes. And to the dens and the caves of the earth, then the faithful witnesses prophesied in sackcloth. Those faithful <coughs> witnesses that died and resurrected. Mm -hmm. um, yet they continued their testimony throughout the entire period of 1260. There was never a time when there wasn't someone, you know, trying to spread the word of God. Mm -hmm. yeah. In the darkest times, there were faithful men who loved God's word and were jealous for his honor. To those loyal servants were given wisdom, power, and authority to declare his truth during this whole time. It's from the Great Controversy, page 267. Okay. Elsewhere, Ellen White said, when France publicly rejected God and set aside the Bible, 
Wicked men and spirits of darkness exulted in their attainment of the object so long desired, a kingdom free from the restraints of the law of God. Now, I think we need to stop and be honest here. What was the problem here? This was not free from the restraints of the law of God. This is free from the restraints, restraints caused by the Catholic Church. The demands for yes. money, all the, you know, all the other things, penances and everything you had to do. This wasn't restraints from just because of the law of God. So the oppressive actions of the church caused people to want to rebel against that. Like a, so we could say a distortion of the laws yes, of God. Yes. Okay, go ahead. You're reading. Yeah, the restraining spirit of God, which imposed a check upon the cruel power of Satan, was in a great measure removed, and he whose only delight is the wretchedness of men was permitted to work his will. Those who have chosen the service of rebellion were left to reap its fruits until the land was filled with crimes too horrible for a pen to trace. From devastated provinces and ruined cities, a terrible cry um, was heard, a cry of bitterest anguish. France was shaken as if by an earthquake. Religion, law, social order, the family, the state, and the church, all were smitten down by the impious hand that had been lifted against the law of God from great, Ellen White, Great Controversy, 286. And, okay, Jim? Consider these topics for discussion. No, Ellen White, above that. Oh, I see, EGW. Unless the church will follow on, on in his, that is God's opening providence, accepting every ray of light, performing every duty which may be revealed, religion will inevitably degenerate into observance of forms and spirit of vital godliness will disappear from the Allied Great Controversy, page 316. <clears throat> okay, so now, what can we draw, what will, can we conclude from this lesson so far, Charles? Well, study guide, how are the principles of the Great Controversy revealed in the French Revolution? Well, you certainly had <laughs> extremes of religion versus de demonism, basically. So religion the, versus pseudo-religion. Yeah. This these uh, ordinary citizens, laborers, they're the ones who said, we had enough. Yeah, yeah. And exactly. they destroyed the government as well as the church. Yeah. That's what it looks like that it happened. Number two, when arguing that there was, there is no God, one person wrote that we are free to establish our own goals and to venture across any intellectual boundaries without looking for no trespassing signs. Okay, does that sound like any group of people that might be existing even today? <laughs> that sounds like the perfect rebellion of teenagers, doesn't it? I, 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 why is that? Don't limit us in any way. Just let us do whatever we want to do. And what happens when that, I mean, what, 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 what is the result when that happens? Chaos. Chaos. Yes. Chaos. Anarchy. Anarchy. Go ahead. Why is that phrase, without looking for no trespassing signs, so instructive to the motives many have to rejecting God? How might such ideas help explain some of what's happened in the French Revolution? Okay, from our Bible study, Adult Teacher's Bible Study Guide. As we think about the power of God's Word and its ability to survive through the Dark Ages, it is important to notice some parallels to the life of Jesus Christ, Jesus Himself. And look at these very carefully. Gordon? From the Bible Study Guide, why do Adventists maintain that the two witnesses or the Holy Scriptures were suppressed during the Middle Ages? Did not the people of that time know th about the Bible? Were not the cathedrals and churches decorated with Bible themes, biblical themes? And you can see the, all the stained glass windows all over with all the Bible themes, but... Distorted mm -hmm. Bible themes. Yeah. Were not the... Well, what, those, those stained glass windows were there because people couldn't read, and so Preachers would stand up and say, okay, look at the window there, let me tell you that story. 
and they told the story the way they wanted to tell it. Yeah, there you are. The way they And I will have to say, I have to tell you this, one of my favorite stories about someone stopped a little girl on the, she'd come up from Sunday school and someone asked her, what is a saint? And she had been in one of those cathedrals and she, her mommy had told that, you know, these are the saints up there in the windows. And she says, well, a saint is someone that the light shines through. Mm. <laughs> she had a lot, very good insight. Yeah, yeah. Didn't realize what she was talking about, but very good wow. insight. The Go light ahead. really does shine through them in yes, addition yeah. to in the stained glass windows. Continuing with the Bible study guide, were not the scholastics teaching their students from the Bible in the or university classes? Theoretically. And aren't they today? Yep. Supposedly? The answer to all these questions is yes. So why insist that the 1260 year period between AD 538 and AD 1798 was a time of persecution, a time when the two witnesses wore sackcloth, a symbol of crisis and humiliation. Before answering the question, let us complicate the issue a bit further. That's what we need. Some may be <laughs> quick to point out that persecution against Scripture existed before AD 38, 538. Of course. Indeed, the Romans attempted to mock or suppress Scripture during the early persecutions against Christians. The pagan emperor Diocletian, from 284, emperor from 284 A.D. to 305, specifically targeted the Bible to be annihilated, ruling that Christians must renounce and denounce their holy book. While most Christians did not have Bibles, some who had biblical manuscripts surrendered them to be publicly burned and desecrated. Others died for their faith instead. Eventually, the Word of God emerged honored and victorious from this onslaught. At the end of the 1260-year prophetic period, French revolutionaries, as well as other later dictatorial, atheistic, and communistic regimes also targeted Christian scripture for annihilation, just as Diocletian had. Can you name any places in the world where the scriptures are being denied or trying to be destroyed or so whatever? Can you name you, any you place that where it isn't? Yeah, that's just about true. Well, South America, they would say they're, they're Christian. But, I mean, look at the communist countries and so forth. Just incredible opposition to the Bible. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Unlike Diocletian, however, the French revolutionaries succeeded in annihilating scripture in their territory for a short period of time. This As we read in Revelation, yeah. yeah. Seven to nine. True, both Diocletian and the insurrectionists of the French Revolution sought to denigrate the word of God, but the French revolutionaries did so by attempting to utterly annihilate it instead of permitting it to be to prophesy. permitting it to prophecy in sackcloth. In addition, the period of 1260 years during which the two witnesses suffered humiliation far exceeds the first two or three centuries of persecution. The 10 years of persecution under Diocletian or the few years of the French Revolution for these reasons, we must look elsewhere in history to discover the meaning of the Word of God ministering in sackcloth. Okay, so you, you can think of other times when there were severe persecution and so forth, but none that would fit the 1260 things. So let's read those verses once again, Revelation 11, 7 to 9. When they finished proclaiming their message, the beast that comes up out of the abyss. Now, now we've talked about these things already, so let's say, who is the beast that comes up out of the abyss? Satan. Satan. Yeah. Let's be very clear about that. The beast that comes out of the abyss will fight against them. He will defeat them and kill them. Did that happen? How many people, uh, even the reformers we know about, were killed? Many of them, right? and their bodies will lie in the street of the great city where the, their Lord was crucified. Now that one is a little more complicated to me. I'm not sure I understand all of that. The symbolic name of that city is Sodom or Egypt, and we've already noticed that Sodom represents what? 
immorality and Egypt represents direct opposition to God, people from all nations, tribes, languages, and races will look at their bodies for three and a half days and will not allow them to be buried. So, what happened? That's a, that's a pretty good description of what happened in, in France for those three and a half years. Okay. Um, Jim? <coughs> Thus to understand when and how the witnesses or the scriptures ministered in sackcloth, we need to emphasize two facts. One, the two witnesses ministered during the period of 1260 years. As our lessons, as our lesson details, Seventh-day Adventists understood, understand that this period spanned from A.D. 538 to 1798 A.D. and encompassed the rise, the establishment, and the rule of the Roman Catholic Church. Two, the two witnesses were not killed during the period, but were clothed in sackcloth. So the allusion to Zechariah 4, excuse me, Zechariah, that is in Revelation 11, 4 and Zechariah 4, 14, Elijah, Revelation 11, 5 and 6, and Moses, Revelation 11, 6 and Revelation 11, seem to suggest that the prophetic ministry of the two witnesses were wearing sackcloth took place within the context of the persecution of God's people. Now let me interrupt there for a second. <clears throat> now we've seen all of these things. We've seen these parallels. I mean, Revelation doesn't say Moses, it doesn't say Elijah, but we've seen these parallel situations, similar things that happened, and we've seen them, the kind of thing. So now, go ahead. Uh, let's see. Revelation 11? Yeah, Revelation 11 does not say that the two witnesses were killed during the 1260 years. Rather, they were empowered by God's, God to prophesy wearing sackcloth during the time. Revelation 11.3. Elijah wore sackcloth during the time of profound spiritual crisis in northern Israel when the nation had consciously and deliberately changed God's law, placing themselves above and against the against God's revelation. Likewise, the major question is not whether the Roman Catholic Church had any knowledge of Scripture or used Scripture at all to, to do theology, at all to do theology during the... Rev so they were purporting to, to, to do religious yeah. things, and they were using Scripture they were bearing false witness, were yeah. they not? Mm -hmm. The question is, what was the church's attitude towards scripture during the persecuting period? The Roman Catholic leader's attitude closely resembled the attitude of Northern Israel. They knew God's special revelation, but they deliberately placed themselves above it. From the so Bible City we're Catholic. saying that during the 1260 years, the Catholics church's attitude toward scripture was very much like Ahab's attitude toward Elijah. Okay, Charles, some passages there. Revelation, Revelation 11, 4. 4. Right, right. Okay, the two witnesses are the two olive trees and the two lambs that stand before the Lord of the earth. Good news Bible. Zechariah 4, 14. Then he said, these are the two men whom God has chosen and anointed to serve him, the Lord, the whole earth. Let me interrupt for a second. It, it could be a little misunderstood there. It sounds like it's talking about two human beings. What it actually says, the, the, the Hebrew there says two anointed ones. And who would the two anointed ones be? The Old Testament and the New Testament. Of course, so this was in the, in the Old Testament before the New Testament existed. Yeah. In Zechariah. Yeah. Okay. Revelation 11, 5, 6. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes out of their mouths and destroys their enemies. Um, and in this way, whoever tries to harm them will be killed. 
they have authority to shut up the sky so that there will be no rain during the time they proclaim God's messages. message. They have authority to uh, also over the springs of water to turn them into blood. They have the authority to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they wish. Okay, let's jump over Revelation 11:13 there because, and Bible study guide, Gordon. From the Bible study guide, the Protestant principles of sola scriptura emphasizes that scripture is the complete, self-sufficient and clear revelation of God. Whenever the divine revelation is an inconvenience or a hindrance to a human project, the devil and his false teachers introduce traditions to justify reinterpreting the inconvenient by biblical passages, or they simply introduce new teachings or practices that are crassly against scripture. Church tradition and the magisterium, magisterium. We'll talk about that in a moment. The are, magisterium is a name for the Pope plus the people who work with him to form church doctrine. The magisterium are, per, are portrayed as the exclusive interpreters of the Bible and as the only authority with the power to create and establish dogmas or truths, teachings. The, God's word is diminished, denigrated, and placed under the control of the church through scripture, clear, though crypt, scripture clearly stipulates that it must be the other way around. In this regard, several quotations from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, or CCC, are simply astonishing. Myra? According to the CCC, or the Catechism of the Catholic Church, God's revelation through His Word in the Holy Spirit is present and active in the Church. And thus, Church tradition is an inseparable part of God's special revelation, just as the, as the prophets and apostles. This is from CCC, page 79. For this reason, the Church, to whom the transmission and the interpretation of Revelation is entrusted, does not derive her certainty about all revealed truths from the Holy Scriptures alone. Both Scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal se sentiments of devotion and reverence. Wow. To the CCC, what? What a, what, a, what a statement. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Two, the CCC does stipulate that the magisterium, being the only interpreter of Scripture, is not superior to the Word of God, but it is a servant. However, the magisterium does not draw only from Scripture, but from both Scripture and tradition, as we just read. Because tradition is of equal authority with Scripture, and because the magisterium, the Pope and the bishops, in communion with him, has the sole authority to authentically interpret the Word of God, the magisterium will draw materials from both tradition and scripture whenever convenient. Taken well, from the recently, Teacher's Bible Study Guide. Yeah. Very recently, the Pope, uh, in his great wisdom, has declared that the Bible is old. It has to be replaced. So they are working on it. Wow. Just as in the experience of the Old Testament and the kingdom of Israel and Judah, when carefully followed all following of the scriptures was set aside, soon human ideas and rules took their place. Notice these ideas which are promoted by the Roman Catholic Church in our day from our Bible study guide. Thus, in misinterpreting and teaching directly against scripture, the Roman Catholic Church claimed the following errors. I know if we're gonna have time to get through all of these, but that it has the power to change God's Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day of the week, that Christ left the church in the charge of the Bishop of Rome and of the sacramental ecclesiastical hierarchy, that the church is a necessary element of God's salvation. In other words, you can't be saved except unless you're a Catholic, that the church and the saints can mediate for people and often uh, offer them merit for salvation, that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was born with a sinless nature, that otherwise called the Immaculate Conception, that Mary has a special role in salvation, being called mediator or mediatrix, advocate, helper, titles reserved in Scripture only for Christ and the Holy Spirit, that salvation is by works, such as penance and indulgences. Which incidentally produce cash for the Roman Catholic yes. Church. And built the St. Peter's Cathedral. 
I don't know if works of indulgences is works. I don't know anyway. Indulgences, if you read the Bible a certain amount of time, then you you can yeah. avoid the fires or the purgatory. purgatory for a certain period of time. Yeah. <clears throat> that there are seven sacraments that impart salvation, that infants must be baptized. And my wife was uh, born in a place where there was a Catholic nun, and she made sure that every kid there was baptized. Then the very substance of the bread and wine are literally changed into the body and blood of Christ during the Mass. I mean, this is just that they can create God. That the so-called laity cannot share in the cup during communion, that the priests themselves and a sacramental sacrament and impart salvation, are a sacrament and impart salvation, that the priests of the church must not marry, having to remain celibate, that Christians can and in fact must venerate and worship images and statues, thus flagrantly transgressing the second commandment. And what do they do about the second commandment? It's, you know, they almost delete it. They pretty much delete it. When it says they remain celibate, what does that mean? Well, they're not supposed to marry. With such a stunning misinterpretation of flagrant rejection of scriptures and its teachings for more than a millennium in and by the self-professed people of God, it comes as no surprise that God describes the scriptures or his two witnesses as dressed and prophesying in sackcloth. Yes, eventually the two witnesses were killed in a secular as opposed to a religious context, that is during the French Revolution. However, the atheistic French Revolution itself was a reaction to the long-standing lawlessness of the Catholic Church against God himself, against his special revelation, and against humanity, who is so desperately in need of salvation. The great controversy is complex. The devil aims to destroy God's revelation in his written word, but he especially aims to suppress the word of God in his church. Thus, satanic objective has not succeeded, nor ever will, it, nor ever will it. The Protestant Sola Scriptura, the Biblical and Missionary Society's Adventist Three Angels' messages, and the loud cry will prevail. God's <coughs> word will be ever clearer in the com communication of God's love. So... You know, that's from the Teacher's Bible Study Guide. That's from the Preacher's Bible Study Guide, and you can see an incredible thing that they have tried to do with God's word. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we review the great masterpiece of the devil here, as we think of the things that he has done to try to destroy or set aside your word, help us not to be deceived. Help us to see clearly through the, your inspired words as, as the reformers did. And may we represent that to all around us as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.